Hello, I'm going to talk to you about temporal bone trauma in the acute setting. The goals of this talk are to review the relevant anatomy, go over how we classify fractures acutely, and know what is really important in the acute setting. So it's important to be able to distinguish between fractures and sutures. Sutures often have very uh, wavy, irregular borders. Fractures are usually straight. and it is important to know where the normal sutures are. So in this patient with a gunshot wound to the head, there are these fractures, but in addition, you can kind of make out the different sutures. So the squamosal suture, parietomastoid suture, petrosquamosal suture. Here's the zygomaticotemporal suture in this area here, just for reference, is the greater wing of the sphenoid. And this is what it would look like if you were to cut out the bones at the sutures around the temporal bone. And here's the squamosal portion of the temporal bone, mastoid portion, tympanic portion, the styloid, and here's the petrous portion of the temporal bone. In this cartoon illustrating the temporal bone structures, you see the external ear with the external auditory canal, tympanic membrane. Then you have the middle ear cavity, which is attached to the eustachian tube and is bordered superiorly by the tegmen tympani. This will become important later on. Inside the middle ear cavity, you have the ossicles. And then here you have the otic capsule, which is the bone surrounding the inner ear structures, including the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canals. Fortunately, in the acute setting, we don't really have to talk too much about a lot of the inner ear structure details. So what's really important, acute setting, patient's got a temporal bone fracture, you want to identify the fracture and describe the course. You want to look for the region of the tympanic membrane and importantly the external auditory canal. Then you want to look at the middle ear and identify if the ossicles are intact and if tegmen tympani is intact. And tegmen tympani is particularly important because if it's disrupted, now you have a connection between the middle ear cavity and the cranial vault. Then we're going to look at the otic capsule and determine if the otic capsule is fractured or not fractured. Then we'll look to see if cranial nerve 7 canal is intact. We'll look at vessels to see if they're involved with a fracture and any other complications. But ultimately, remember, what is really, really important, it's probably everything but the temporal bone, because these patients might have severe brain injuries, so you got to make sure you pick up the epidural hemorrhage, the, the, the subdurals, the uh, parenchymal hemorrhages, the, the, the diffuse axonal injuries, pontine hemorrhages, all these things that are going to really affect the patient's prognosis. And then ultimately, you're going to be telling the surgeons to call a surgical specialist. Now, even in the ENT literature, they make an argument that once you identify a temporal bone fracture on brain CT, you don't necessarily need a temporal bone study. Even in a patient with conductive hearing loss and no evidence of facial nerve injury, CSF leak or nystagmus, they say does not necessarily need further CT evaluation, particularly acutely. So we used to classify fractures based solely on their orientation, and you should still characterize the direction and location of where the fractures go and what structures they extend through, and if they're along the petrous bone, you would call them a longitudinal fracture. If it uh, crosses the petrous bone perpendicular to its longitudinal axis, then that would be a transverse fracture. Longitudinal fractures are more common, um, but most frequently, especially in bad trauma, you see complex fractures and very complicated fractures with multiple fracture patterns in multiple directions. But again, just focus on describing the fracture pattern and the course, and don't worry too much about classifying it as longitudinal, transverse, complex, etc. We'll talk about why later on. So then you're going to look at the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane. And I'll remind you that the anterior wall of the external auditory canal is the posterior border of the glenoid fossa.
for the mandibular condyle. Now, the reason you, you want to look at the external auditory canal and tell them about any fractures going through it is because if it's fractured, there is a chance that if the patient is left untreated, the canal will heal, but it will heal narrowed and scarred down. And what will happen is these patients will need future surgeries to correct that. Whereas if you pack the canal or you go in and you open it up, you may not want to pack it because of the risk of infection, but if they open it up, then the risk if it, of it healing in a scarred or deformed manner is much less. The clinicians will often know if there's an external auditory canal fracture because of uh, blood in the canal, but they may not recognize it, and it's, it's certainly helpful to have you mention it in the report. So let's take a look at a couple different fractures. This is the same patient who had bilateral temporal bone fractures, and here you see the transverse fracture going through the mastoid air cells. And I'll just take this opportunity to remind you that if you see mastoid opacification in a patient who has had trauma, you assume there's a temporal bone fracture until proven otherwise. So here you have the fracture, transverse fracture, coming down, down. You're following it as we go down, down, and then right through the external auditory canal. So you're going to mention that. And then on this longitudinal fracture, here you have the fracture. You're going down. You're following the fracture, following it, following it, following it right into that external auditory canal. Then on the coronal images, here's the fracture right through external auditory canal. And then on the left side, fracture through the external auditory canal. Then we're going to take a look at the middle ear. And again, here are the middle ear structures. And you want to pay particular attention to tegmin tympani. Because if tegmin tympani is disrupted, um, you will have this opening between the cranial vault and the middle ear. And the concern is the development of a meningitis. So if the tegmin tympani is disrupted, there's a 3% risk of the patient developing meningitis if the CSF leak persists for up to seven days, and then a 23% chance if you go over seven days. So if the CSF leak persists, they may decide to uh, perform surgery. And then, of course, you'll look at the ossicles. So let's take a look at a fracture. So here's external auditory canal. Here's the middle ear cavity. And you can already see that the bone of the tegmin tympani is disrupted. And there's going to be air above the level of the tegmin tympani. There you go. As we scroll back, there's even bone fragments in this case going above the tegmin tympani. And you can have fractures of the that go through the middle ear, and uh, the tegmin tympani will still be intact, as on the contralateral side. So then we're going to look at the ossicles, and you want to make sure that the malleus and the incus are still located together, and this joint is not widened, and of course that the head is not completely dislocated. And here's the malleus, and then this is the incus with the body and the short process. Now here is a normal view again, and here are two examples of ossicular dislocation. So you don't have to have a fracture to have ossicular dislocation. Uh, explosions can cause the ossicles to dislocate, and the self-defense ear clap technique where you slap the assailant's ears with closed hands uh, can disrupt the ossicles. So then we get into classifying the fracture, and you're going to state whether or not it's otocapsule involving or sparing. So the otocapsule is this bone that's around the bony labyrinth, and you'll want to determine if the fracture runs through the bone and may be impacting any of these inner ear structures. And here you have the, the 
cochlea, round window, the oval window, the superior horizontal and posterior semicircular canals. When this is studied and you compare the traditional classification system to a classification system where you just say whether or not the otocapsule is fractured or not, the traditional classification system is not predictive of complications, whereas the otocapsule based system is predictive of complications with a five-fold increase of facial nerve injury, a 25-fold increase in sensory neural hearing loss, and an eight-fold increase in CSF otorrhea. So here is just an example of a patient who's a post-gunshot wound to the temporal bone, and there was a fracture extending through the otocapsule. So this is otocapsule involving. Now, then we're going to look for evidence of facial nerve injury, and the reason this is important acutely is because surgical outcomes are best within 72 hours of dysfunction and fracture. It's injured in up to 7% of temporal bone fractures, and we're going to be particularly concerned with the labyrinthine, tympanic, and mastoid portions of the facial nerve. The others are outside of the temporal bone or not well, visual, or not well visualized with CT. So in order to find the seventh canal, I'm going to find the internal auditory canal, and I'm going to go to its superior most portion. And then I'm going to look for this little hook, which is the labyrinthine portion of the seventh canal. And then I look for this bend, which is the genu. So you can scroll up a little bit, and that marks the region of the geniculate ganglion. Then from the geniculate ganglion, we're going to follow the seventh canal posteriorly. So here's the end. We're going to keep going. Go. And then here it is. And you'll see it's passing right by the middle ear cavity, right by the middle ear, down, down. And now you get to where it makes the turn uh, for the posterior genu. And then it enters the mastoid portion of the facial canal. And here you see the fracture showing up. And now here you see the fracture going right through that facial canal, the mastoid portion. So here's the seventh nerve canal and the fracture. Then you always want to look into planes. So you're going to look in the coronal to find the seventh nerve on the coronal. Again, you're going to go to the superior most portion of the internal auditory canal because you remember seven up, coke down and then we're going to move anteriorly. So here's, so coke down being the cochlear nerve. So we're going to move anteriorly. There you go, you're following it. This is the labyrinthine portion again. Now we're at the genu, so the gen, we're at the geniculate level, the geniculate ganglion. And now we're going to start coming back posteriorly. Okay, here it is. And um, here it is. And then here is that facial nerve canal. And it's running right by the middle ear. This is the tympanic portion of the facial canal. And if you're having trouble finding it, it's good to find the horizontal semicircular canal and look right below it. Then you'll find the seventh nerve canal. And then you can always trace it back. Okay, here we go, we go, we go, and now we're heading down. There, that was the po that was the posterior genu, and now here's the mastoid portion of the facial canal. Now we want to be wary of complications of temporal bone fractures. So, if you see a fracture extending into the carotid canal, you want to be wary of a carotid injury. So, I wanted to show you what the normal carotid canal looks like. So, it's right here. This is where the carotid passes through the uh, temporal bone, the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Here's carotid canal again, carotid canal. And in my experience, these are a bit unusual where the fracture passes through the canal and there's a carotid injury. Quite often there's a fracture that goes to the canal, but most of the time there's no vascular injury. Here's an example of a pretty severe temporal bone fracture where you have the carotid and then you have narrowing within that uh, petrous portion of the carotid canal. And here's the fracture, and, and here you can see the, the narrowing. And these are curved 
planar reformatted images. Here again, here's that, that carotid, and, and here is where it's narrowed down because of the fracture. You also want to be wary if the fracture goes through the regions of the jugular vein or the sigmoid sinus. And so here you can see the fossa for the sigmoid sinus and for the jugular and fracture goes through these areas. So you want to look with contrast and here you have contrast or pacification of the sigmoid sinus with a filling defect. Contrast or pacification, filling defect, filling defect, contrast. We already talked a little bit about CSF leak. Again, I'll remind you if the tegmin is disrupted and if the tympanic membrane is disrupted as well, the patient will have odoria. But if the tympanic membrane is intact, then the CSF may just drain through the eustachian tube and the patient will have rhinorrhea if it persists for seven to 10 days they'll often do surgery, and you should be wary for a meningoencephalocele. Perilymphatic fistulas can occur with trauma. It's associated with disruption of the round window. They'll often have conductive hearing loss. They may have uh, nausea and vomiting. You don't have to have trauma, just implosions, explosions, and loud noises have caused perilymphatic fistulas. And uh, inner ear perilymph may extend into the middle ear cavity. And what you could see on CT is air within those inner ear structures. And so here you have air here. So I hope you find this helpful for tackling uh, temporal bone trauma in the acute setting. Thanks and good luck.